Um, so hi, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Ana Maria Pisson, and I'm a second year graduate student at Harvard, uh, working with Andrew Uden and with my advisor, Ruth Murray Clay. And today, I would like to talk to you um, about the minimum mass, uh, uh, the minimum core mass for giant plant formation. Now, when you think about the minimum core mass, we think of core accretion. And we know that in the core accretion model, in order to be able to form a giant planet, you need to first to form a core. Now, this core grows, and once it becomes massive enough, it can accumulate a significant atmosphere. Now, how big of, big of a core do we need? Well, typically, this value is assumed to be of about 10 Earth masses. However, this is not a constant, and it not only depends on where you're in the disk, but also on how far your core grows. Uh, so now, why do we care about this minimum core mass? Well, we have seen throughout this week um, giant planets directly emitted Y separations. We don't know whether core accretion can work at large separations or not. But if it does, we need to understand this mechanism better. And more importantly, it is very important to be able to place a robust absolute minimum on the core mass that is needed to form a giant planet within the lifetime of the protoplanetary disk. And this is what I would like to talk about today. So let's start with the standard model. So in the standard core accretion model, we know that in order to be able to form a core that is massive enough to gain an atmosphere, we need, on average, a high planetesimal accretion rate. So these incoming planetesimals heat up the atmosphere of the planet, which instead releases energy, resulting in a high luminosity. So at all times, the atmosphere is in a steady state in which all the energy from incoming planetesimals is radiated away by the atmosphere. So in this scenario, the core and the atmosphere grow simultaneously, and the mass of the atmosphere is a function of the core mass. So let's look at this a bit more closely. Since the mass of the atmosphere is a function of the mass of the core, every core, map, or every core mass maps uniquely to one atmosphere mass. Moreover, a larger cores hold a fractional larger atmosphere masses. So the core grows, the atmosphere also grows faster, and at some point, the mass of the atmosphere becomes comparable to the core mass. At this point, a rapid phase of runaway gas accretion can start, and a massive uh, atmosphere can be accumulated to form a giant planet. And so, for a given set of these conditions, there is one well-defined core mass for which the mass of the atmosphere is equal to the core mass. And this is what is called in standard studies the critical core mass. This is the minimum mass to be able to form a giant planet during the lifetime of the disk. Now, this is the story when planetesimal accretion occurs at a standard rate. However, planetesimal accretion does not need to be constant at a given location in the protoplanetary disk throughout the disk lifetime. And this has been shown by, uh, by several studies and has been mentioned in the previous talk by uh, Mikhail uh, Lambert. So let's imagine a different scenario. First, we're in the standard situation. We have a high planetesimal uh, accretion regime. We form a core <coughs> that has an atmosphere that is significantly smaller compared to the core mass. Then the core grows but its atmosphere remains relatively small. And at this stage, planetesimal accretion goes down. Now, the core no longer grows significantly, and the atmosphere still loses energy, <coughs> but it's not going to be able to gain energy from planetesimal accretion anymore. Instead, it's going to gain energy from accretion of gas and gas contraction. So in this situation here, where, when, uh, where we, when we are in a low planetesimal accretion regime, the luminosity evolution of the atmosphere is no longer dominated by a planetesimal accretion, but is dominated by Kelvin, Kelvin Helmholtz gas contraction. All right, so now, remember that I told you that in the, in the standard case, the mass of the atmosphere is a function of the core mass. Now, in our situation, the core no longer grows significantly, and instead, the mass of the atmosphere is a function of time. So we start with a fixed core with a small atmosphere, the atmosphere grows in time, and at some point, the mass of the atmosphere becomes comparable to the core mass at which point runaway accretion can start. And so in this situation, at least in theory, every core can have an atmosphere with a mass equal to its own. Now the question is, of course, how fast can we form this core? So our goal in this work was to determine the minimum core mass needed to be able to form a giant planet during the lifetime of the protoplanetary disk, assuming <coughs> that we are in a low planetesimal accretion regime and the atmosphere evolution is dominated by Kelvin Helmholtz contraction. Now, why do we assume this extreme case? Well, we know that core accretion doesn't really work at wide separation, as Aroma Rafikov pointed out. 
So maybe it would be easier if, for example, we could form an atmosphere with a smaller core. So let's first talk about the assumptions of the model. Um, we're in a low planetesimal accretion regime, so the core no longer grows, it has a fixed mass. We assume a standard two-layer atmosphere composed of an inner convective region and an outer radiative region that are separated by the Schwarzschild criteria. Moreover, the atmosphere is assumed to be spherically symmetric and in hydrostatic balance. One additional assumption that we make is that the luminosity in the outer radiative region of the atmosphere is constant. And we have found that this is a good approximation until the mass of the atmosphere becomes comparable to the core mass, which is the regime that we're interested in. All right, so here um, we're building a quasi-static atmosphere model and we're making a set of standard assumptions. Uh, the atmosphere structure is dictated by the standard equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, thermal equilibrium. We assume that the atmosphere matches smoothly onto the disk at the Hill radius. And as a fiducial disk model, we assume a minimum mass passively rated disk. Um, for the opacity, we assume a standard dust ISM power law opacity. Now, what I would like to draw your attention to is the equation of state. The equation of state can be parametrized by the adiabatic gradient del ad. So we first use an ideal gas polytropic equation of state uh, with del ad to seventh diatomic gas. And as I will show later on, we also use realistic equation of state tables they take, that take into account non-ideal effects such as dissociation or ionization. And as I will show, this actually turns out to make an important difference in our calculations. All right. So here, I just want to show you an example of some of these static uh, radial profiles. So this pressure, temperature, and mass as a function of radius for a planet forming a 10 AU and with a core mass of five Earth masses. So this just shows instantaneous snapshots of the atmosphere at different stages and its evolution. These numbers here uh, represent the total mass, core plus atmosphere. So the only takeaway point from this plot is that for a fixed atmosphere mass, we can generate a unique static atmosphere profile. All right, so now we have these static profiles, but in order to be able to obtain a time evolution, we need to connect them to a cooling model. And this is the cooling equation that we use. All this equation is saying that in order for the atmosphere to be able to accrete more gas and contract, it needs to radiate away energy. Now, in case of a star, we know that the total luminosity is balanced by the rate at which energy is lost. So you just have L is equal minus D dt. These two additional terms come up because we're not talking about, about an isolated sphere, but about a planet that is embedded into a gas disk. So the second term here accounts for the fact that uh, energy is brought in from a finite radius, such as the Hill radius, with a specific accretion energy. And I would like to point out that this is gas that is brought in, brought, being brought in. This has nothing to do with planetesimal accretion, which we set to zero. This is gas accretion. The last term here is just the PDV work done on a mass element as the atmosphere contracts. So now, by um, connecting series of subsequent um, static atmospheres, we can find the delta t between the two of them. And so by stacking them together, we can obtain an evolutionary history for the planet. So here, I just want to show you, again, just an example of this time evolution. This time versus atmosphere mass, again, for the same planet, uh, forming a 10 AU with a core of five Earth masses. All right, now, I would like to go back to this slide and remind you what I said earlier. In our assumptions, we have a fixed core with an atmosphere that grows in time. And at some point, its mass becomes comparable to the core mass, and runaway accretion can start. So in this scenario, every core can have an atmosphere equal to its own. The problem, of course, is, and the question is, how fast can we create this atmosphere? So let's calculate that. So we define the time um, up until runaway accretion is initiated as a crossover time. And here in this plot, I'm showing the time evolution as a function of atmosphere mass, as well as the crossover time by, marked by the circles, for a series of cores with different masses. So the numbers here represent the core mass and Earth masses. So we can see that the crossover time is shorter for larger cores, since it is easier for a more massive core to accumulate an atmosphere. Now, of course, we want to be able to form this planet before the gas in the protoplanetary disk dissipates. So here, I'm plotting a typical lifetime of a protoplanetary disk of three million years. So all the cores that are above this line, so with masses in this particular case at 10 AU, uh, less than seven Earth masses, are not going to be able to accumulate a significant atmosphere during the disk lifetime. On the other hand, all the cores that are below this line, so with masses larger than seven Earth masses in this case, 
will be able to initiate runaway gas accretion and form a giant planet. So the takeaway message is that there is a minimum core mass for which an atmosphere, for which um, the minimum core mass for which an atmosphere can form before the dissipation of the protoplanetary disk. And this is what in our study we call the critical core mass. So in this plot here, I'm showing the critical core mass as a function of semi-major axis uh, in, the case of, uh, in the case of an ideal diatomic gas. So we see already that even in the more inner parts of the disk, this value is smaller than the standard 10 Earth mass value. And in a couple of minutes, I will uh, try to compare these results with some of the standard planetesimal accretion results. But first, I would like to discuss some of the factors that affect this critical core mass. So as expected, uh, the critical core mass depends on this temperature and this pressure. It also depends on the mean molecular weight of the gas. Um, one thing I would like to draw your attention to is the opacity. So I mentioned that we use the standard, standard ASM opacity. However, we don't really know what the opacity uh, of the dust is. It could be higher or it could be lower. We're inclined to believe that it would be lower in our study due to dust settling since we're in a low planetesimal accretion region. So here, I want to we explore the effects of a, a, redu a reduction in opacity. So we've, um, I'm comparing our results for a standard ISM opacity and the standard ISM opacity reduced by a factor of 100. And this, this opacity is similar to the opacities that are used in some of the standard uh, studies, such as those of Roman Rafikov. And you can see that um, uh, this reduced opacity yields significantly lower core masses, um, up to a factor of five lower. So actually, the opacity matters. So now, as I mentioned earlier, I would just, make, I would just make, like to make this rough comparison. So here, I'm comparing um, my results with the reduced opacity with the results obtained uh, by, um, in, in a standard uh, planetesimal accretion um, case for an intermedi intermediate planetesimal accretion rate under similar um, assumptions about the opacity and about the disk conditions. Um, so we see here that our results yield lower core masses than the standard case. So it is easier to form a giant planet by first forming the core and then accumulating the atmosphere. Moreover, our, results, our result represents an absolute minimum on the core mass that is needed to form a giant planet. Our core no longer grows, so you can't, really go, you can't go, uh, lower than this. All right, so going back to the factors that affect the cross over time, I would like to draw your attention again to the equation of state. So I mentioned earlier that in addition to the ideal gas uh, equation of state, we also use realistic equation of states. Uh, tables. So here I'm plotting the adiabatic gradient, which again is a stand-in for the equation of state, as the function of gas uh, temperature and pressure. So at high temperatures, hydrogen dissociates and ionizes. At low temperatures, um, the uh, rotational states of the hydrogen molecule are only partially excited, so it no longer behaves like an ideal gas. And I'm not going to go into the details of this plot, but what we have found is that these variations in the adi adiabatic gradient have two competing effects on the atmosphere evolution, thank you. Um, they affect the luminosity of the atmosphere and they affect the amount of energy per unit mass that can be brought in. And together, we have found that they yield longer crossover time and therefore larger critical core masses. So in this plot here, I've added the uh, critical core mass as a function of semi-major axis for a realistic equation of state uh, with an opacity given by the standard ISM opacity. And we see that um, the, the realistic equation of state increases the critical core mass by more than a factor of two. So it turns out that these non-ideal effects actually make a significant difference into our calculations. So I would just like to um, leave here a few takeaway points. So in this study, we have um, calculated the minimum core mass to form a giant planet during the lifetime of the protoplanetary disk, assuming that we are in a low planetesimal accretion regime and the luminosity evolution is dominated by kelvin helmholtz contraction. We have found that the critical core mass is smaller as we move further out in the protoplanetary disk. We have also found that this critical core mass is smaller than in similar studies that assume uh, standard planetesimal accretion rates. So this result represents an absolute minimum on the core mass needed to form a giant planet. Moreover, we found that in some cases, the critical core mass may be smaller than 10 Earth masses. However, by taking into account the realistic, realistic effects of a realistic equation of state, turns out that this brings this critical core mass back up to a value close to 10 Earth masses. But again, I would like to point out that this va value varies depending on where you're in the disk, and it also depends a lot on the opacity. So, thank you.
Okay, so we have a bit of time for some questions. Oh, there, Doug, sorry. Um, many um, superheroes have masses in excess of 10 Earth's masses, but they did not evolve into gas giants. Is this a problem for you? Um, can, can you clarify the question? Sorry. Uh, Kepler's data mm -hmm. indicate many super Earths may have mass in excess of 10 Earth's masses and relatively close to their whole star. Is that a problem? Uh, is there a consistency problem with what you determine for the core, critical core mass to those guys because they probably have achieved critical core mass but did not acquire an envelope? So I think it's well, it depends because they may have achieved this critical core mass in a slower timeline. So by the time that, um, that uh, gas has been dissipated, depending on the opacity and depending. Um, uh, and also, uh, I am particularly interested in the outer parts of the disk. Um, so, and if, I guess my answer is that no, I don't think there is a discrepancy. I just think that it might just be the case that it's, those planets just did not form fast enough in that particular disk. So they did not, there was no, more, no, there was no longer gas in the disk to be able to accumulate um, I don't know, gaseous atmosphere. Okay, uh, back up here. Yeah, I, I think I agree with Doug that it's a bit of a uh, problem there. I think one of the reasons that with pebble accretion it works is because you keep on uh, depositing pebbles which provide the luminosity which essentially makes your atmosphere unstable to something that has very high mean molecular weight, but not to an envelope that is just pure hydrogen helium that prevents essentially the formation of a giant, gas giant planet around what we expect an ice, to be an ice giant. Because it's not only super Earths, it's also the ice giants. It's a problem if you predict small core masses going out, at least for the solar system. So I predict that there's a good discussion to happen during the coffee break. <laughs> Any uh, other questions about the... Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah.